Subscribe to 15 Second Spotlight on YouTube and to wherever you listen to podcasts. So Ellen, you were just saying that we have some fun stuff to talk about, but before we do that, I was actually thinking maybe we should introduce ourselves. And sounds I, like a great idea. And I was thinking maybe we could do it in a bit of a different way. And what I'd like to ask you is why do you do what you do? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, sometimes I wonder what it is I actually do. Um, <laughs> it just feels so natural to me and like the thing that I love the most. But I guess that answers your question. I, I do what I do, which is using neuroscience to, I don't know, as a tool to help everyone that I work with, to help anyone who wants to try make sense of their lives, find what feels like purpose, and live with more joy and satisfaction. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. What about you, Sam? Well, why do I do what I do? It's If I look back on it, there's probably, you know, it's only when you look back that you can connect the dots, but there's Think probably been a few pivotal moments in my life. And if you were to meet me, and I share this sometimes with people, if you were to meet me as an eight-year-old, you probably would have found me out front in my front of the house in the garden with a blackboard. And I would have taken up the chalkboard from downstairs in the basement and I would be teaching people um, in my neighborhood what I learned at school that week. And uh, I realized I was really fortunate to get <laughs> exposure to different ways of thinking and different communities because of the school that I went to than others were. Yeah. And I loved taking what I had learned and sharing it with others. But I also was super curious and was always asking, but why? And I think that's so, still what I do today is I ask a lot of, but why do I do this? Or why does this happen? And I just love being curious and learning and then sharing that with people. So it's great when I get to have moments like this where I get to learn from you and we get to share with others. It's fantastic. And curiosity is one of the great gifts and one that we can always activate and reclaim even when we think it's left us. It's one of the healthiest things for our beings, our bodies, and our brains. It'll I love that. My body actually literally starts to vibrate as you said that, um, which actually kind of brings us to today's topic because it's not a talking. Yeah. Uh, I had mentioned to you that I was in this place of not knowing or at least trying to get into more of a place around being comfortable with not knowing. And it, then you brought up the topic of how that really ties into intuition and also just you. wishing is something that's um, up in your mind, but also... You know, we kind of thought we should start off with talking about, like, what is intuition, actually? Vicky. Like, where does right. that come from? Right. Hey, and I want to ask, hey, you, a ask you a question. Is there a little buzzing in the background? There is a little buzzing in the background. Are and those I'm cicadas? Open. Is that what it is? They're cicadas. Well, it's amazing. I'll just say for anyone who's listening doesn't know what a cicada is, it's a quite a large beetle and Sam is in the Caribbean right now and they're very much, you know, in the equatorial region and in tropical environments. But I think that the kind that you're hearing right now, they pupate for seven years. So what a great thing to think about incubation because they have no idea what they're going to be when they come out seven years later. And then when they come out seven years later, they all emerge at the same time. And you can hear them start in the morning and you can hear them shut off in the evening, this beautiful sort of, I don't know, to me it sort of sounds like a singing bowl or something like that that's just running all day in the tropics. So it's wonderful to hear them, Sam. Oh, it's funny because I thought it was coming from your side. Oh, no. Well, maybe it's just like some digital noise or something. We can pretend maybe it's, it's just the cicadas. digital world telling us that you're vibrating so high. We were going to bring yeah. some cicadas to life. Ooh, I was so like, funny. oh, wow, you just got cicadas in the wintertime. Amazing. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, let's talk about intuition because that was the question, right? Yes. Okay. What is intuition? What it, so I think intuition is, I would say very broadly, it's an intelligence we can't explain, at least not through our current understanding of the brain. Now, Sam, I have to tell you, I think differently about the brain than a lot of other people do. Most of us could look up the brain online or look at pictures of a brain, or I could run into the other room and grab my model of a brain and bring it out and show you. And it would show this thing that lives inside our skull, inside our cranium. But I think the brain is so much more than that. First of all, in my research, I have become increasingly convinced that the only reason people think the brain cuts off here is because it became extremely easy for science illustrators and the scientists who did dissections and so forth 
to stop the brain here and go, aha, the brain is there. If you really look at the way the brain works, no. The brain, the very, very center of it, the lower center of it is something called the midbrain. And coming from the midbrain is a protrusion that drops down called the medulla oblongata. And the medulla oblongata literally becomes the spinal cord, which goes down in through the vertebra of the spine and then connects as it does both directly and indirectly to the brain. So there are, I think, seven nerves that correct directly, connect directly to the brain, but then there are innumerable nerves that connect to the nervous system throughout the body. The body receives information in certain contexts before the brain does. We have evidence for this. The heart receives information in certain contexts before the brain does. We don't quite understand it yet, but I see that. You know, people go, the heart receives it, the body receives it, signals it up to the brain. No, I think it is all a brain. It's all working together. So I believe to me that intuition is a type of intelligence that the body and or the brain receives from the external environment that factors into the way we think, make decisions, and mm -hmm. behave. And simply because intuition is not always measurable or seeable does not mean it doesn't exist. I mean, if you look at the data, I think it's something like 85% of people in the United States alone believe that they have received information from in a way that they can't explain or understand the yeah. intuition. Um, the way we feel before we walk into a room the way we feel when we meet someone that we really connect with. This is a form of intelligence that simply because we don't have a conventional neuroscience grounded way to explain it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It, it's interesting that you say that because part of what my exploration personally has been is around, there's a lot that I tend to know in my mind and I think about. <laughs> um, however, I've been doing a lot more work to understand actually what's happening in my body. What's my body telling me? Because I have this whole yeah. other organism around me that's alive and that picks <laughs> up signals. But I'm, I'm curious for myself around what are those things that either I'm not connected to or I'm missing that maybe even knows before I do? And right. how do I tap more into that um, which I, I think kind of ties into that piece around not knowing or at least pushing down what I think I know from a cognitive perspective QP. and then being able to tap into those other sources. Mm -hmm. So one of the things for me with intuition is it served me really well in my life. I mean, there's a lot of decisions that I've made that have been in the moment. I've gone with my gut. I'm actually, even the call that I had prior to this was both of us got on the call and we said, I don't think there's going to be a fit for the upcoming 15 seconds festival because of timing and other things. But I felt like we still needed to get on this call. And fast forward to an hour later, we've had this incredible yeah. discussion. We've been able to kind of connect each other into our different worlds. We've learned from each other. And part of that to me is intuition. But well, as you mentioned, like a lot of times we discount intuition. So oh, why is it that you think that we like override this? Right. Well, for a minute, I'm going to answer in reverse order because I kind of heard four questions and they're all <laughs> they're awesome. I always have too many questions. Ellen. I love it. <laughs> So the first one, why do we override it? Okay, for, for first of all, the brain responds to the conditioning it receives throughout its life. Um, and there's sort of a great adage from neuroscience that says, your brain will do more of whatever it's doing right now. When, my dear Samantha, when in your education were you encouraged to use your education rather than your, your, your intuition rather than your brain? Zip. When you were a tiny little girl and you're going around, even before you were doing those chalkboards in the front yard, you're going around with an imaginary friend. People would say, oh, your imaginary friend doesn't exist. Or if you said something that really felt real to you, maybe an adult came back to you and said, oh, you're making that up. You have an active imagination. The value of intuition is so discounted in our current culture, and it is a form of intelligence. In fact, if we looked across the realm of long surviving human cultures, long surviving human societies, cultures that have lived 110,000 years on this planet over much more hardship than I would know how to navigate, right? 40,000 years, 25,000 years, 10,000 years, much longer than we've been around. All of them actively cultivate a practice of intuitive knowing. We just need to know that. When I think about decision-making for myself, for example, this is sort of coming back to question number three, I think I have three participants in my board of directors. I have my brain, cognitive and mental functions. 
I have my emotions, the feelings of my heart, you know, the way I feel about a person, the way I feel about a person for better or for worse. And then I also have my gut, what does my body tell me? And when I'm making big decisions, sort of two things I try to do to continue actively cultivating that intuition. I often think, okay, before I make this decision, I'm gonna decide how to decide. I want at least a yeah. two out of three vote from my board of directors. And I'm usually pretty wary of the emotional because that's the one that gets hooked the most, right? So I might say, okay, what does my gut tell me? What does my hunch tell me? Huh, interesting. Is my brain trying to override that in a certain way? Yeah, very often it is. Great, what's the value of that? What's good about that? And then emotionally, how can I settle with this? So it might sound like that would take a lot of time. With practice, it happens. You don't even know you're doing it, right? So back to your questions for, for one moment here. I think your question was, why do we override it? Was that where we were going? Yeah, why do we override it? Like, why do we push it down when there's things that we have these moments where we know we want to do it or we feel that we should, but however, we let like our mind... And I, I am going to call it overthinking because we go into this pattern of I'm going to try and justify everything. Good. And we push yes. down that initial instinct. You apply the rational, you apply rational thought to something that is usually much more complex than the rational realm the... can really navigate. I also want to invite you, as you think about using the word mind, I watch your hands both times go here. I think the mind, and Buddhist thought aligns with this, the mind is the body. You know, in, in Buddhism, traditional Buddhism, we're feeling and sensing with our mind, which is much bigger than our brain. In the Western world, we tend to emphasize thinking, the mental process. This is about a, this is an ex interesting experiment in the use of the brain compared to things like in the Neolithic or the Paleolithic or the earlier 200 or more thousand years of human existence. But in this time and place, we look at the rational or thinking mind. You know, there's you know, Descartes, you know, I think, therefore I am, you know, that it's it's actually, if you say that I think, but therefore I am, then what do you say about a baby? Because a baby isn't really thinking yet. Thinking is learned, but a baby certainly am, right? It's a real thing. So I would say this is the mind, right? All of this, all of this being is the mind. Maybe even this is the mind extending out. There are many who do. You, for example, the collective consciousness, the things we're absorbing from each other and from the gestalt, you know? And then also the brain, the rational thinking brain. And you know me well enough, Sam, to know that I also think we overuse the left hemisphere of the brain in this culture and increasingly, which is the hemisphere of linear pursuit of outcomes. It is not the hemisphere of big picture thinking and context. It's about move through time to get what we're looking for, to complete what we're doing for, to check it off the list. This side of the brain is a little bit of a intuition smasher. The balanced brain is, because of the right hemisphere, is much more likely to connect with the intuitive. Yeah, as you're saying that, what I'm thinking about is uh, Dan Siegel's work and how he separates um, the mind from the brain. Good. And the brain being that part that processes things and that we think with versus the mind being oh. integral around all of those experiences, as you're mentioning, like the full body, those you know, with those young in the dreams or looking at all of the components that make us who we are and kind of what that whole ego said. versus being both of them. Let's go back to that separation because it brings up something really interesting. In our body, we have a number of organs and they each serve a function. We have a liver, we have a heart, we have a spleen, an appendix, all the things, right? And we have a brain. The brain is an organ, a biological technology or a biological device that runs a series of activities, electrical and chemical activities, designed to keep us safe and alive. It's the survival organ. And the brain, left to itself, will simply use what has kept you safe and alive in the past, which is everything you've already done, and sort of double down on that, lock you into it as a way of continuing to keep you safe and alive. Because if you're here and I'm here, the evidence is in. We're safe and alive left to itself, which is probably my favorite phrase in neuroscience, left to itself, the brain will keep running the same programs again and again, whether we like them or not, because the evidence yeah. is in, we're safe and alive, right? So the but practice of inviting in more neuroscience is actually a very intentional, the, the intentional part of the brain right up here, a very intentional practice, and Dan Siegel speaks a lot about this too, 
of developing this sort of presence that has room for body feelings, that has room for then, hunches or hesitations or whatever else. And as he'll say, or as I say, the best way to practice this is with the breath. So at any moment, the brain, and especially the left hemisphere, will shut down the intuition and it will call back on what it has done before in the past, you know, those sort of hardwired patterns and habits. And it'll run that program left to itself. However, if we wish to interrupt it, we wish to consider other options. It's one breath away and in time. All we have to do is acknowledge, just sense that the brain has a program that it's running. It may not be the program that we want. And within one breath, we bring the sort of oxygen to the brain and the sort of presence to the mind that might allow us to listen to our body and listen to our intuition a bit more. So a question for you is, on that then, do you think you can develop your capacity to tap into your intuition? And is do you think it's because of those practices that some people might perceive that others have better intuition than others? It, well, first of all, they're both really interesting questions, and they have slightly different answers. So the first thing about can you practice and development, develop it, I can't say yes enough. Yes upon yes upon yes upon yes. Anything in the body and in the brain can be enhanced through practice. And so learning to slow down, learning to say, what does my body tell me right now? How do I feel about this? These are all practices for intuition. I also love for people to do a little bit of an intuition audit where they think about their questions you can get for this online, where you, you know, their questions really simple, like, have you ever, ever had a feeling something would happen and then it happened? Have you ever felt like you knew the end of a story before you actually read it? Did you ever have a feeling when you met someone that turned out to be true? There are so many times when we actually have witnessed and experienced intuitive knowing, intuitive intelligence in our lives, but we tend not to really pay attention to that because it's not emphasized in our culture. Right? So you asked if we could, I'm so interested in this conversation, I keep kind of forgetting the questions, but you, you asked, you asked about can we practice in development? The development, the answer was yes. What was the second part of your question, Sam? That if we can work on developing it, but also do you think because people sometimes there's a perception that oh. some people have better intuition than others? And I'm wondering if what's factoring into that is that just some people for capacity I'm gonna say have practiced their capacity um to understand and tap into their intuition. It's both a it's a wonderful and a little bit of an unanswerable question, at least on the current level of of knowledge, whatever that means. So first of all, we can test people and find out that some people are really good receptors of intuitive information. Like you can put a hundred people in a room, create small teams, and find out sort of through certain exercises where they exchange information, some people are really good receivers. Some people are also really good senders of what seems to be intuitive information. When these groups are then optimized, sort of A-B testing, so that the best senders are partnered with the best receivers, thank you, cicadas, we actually find that there are some people who are really super receivers of intuitive information. Why is that? Well, let's look at what would form any brain and thus any identity persona, call it what you will. First, biology, genetics and epigenetics, right? So kind of the, the if you will, the genetic thumbprint or fingerprint that makes the unique constellation that is us. Everyone is unique on a DNA perspective. Everyone is unique on an RNA perspective, which is sort of a, an adaptive response. Uh, it's called, you know, it's the more ribosome response to the genetic code. And that is the imprint on the genetic blueprint that carries things like inherited memory or things that are intergenerational and so forth. So biologically and then culturally, or what I call environmentally, the environment that we're born in. So Sam, let's say that you were born 6,000 years ago in Wales. You would have lived in an environment where people regularly practiced indigenous forms of, excuse me, intuitive forms of knowing as a way of survival. They would be receiving information about things that are coming. People would be reading messages in clouds and so forth. That in your environment of that time would have invited you to participate in those processes in ways that helped you continue to hone your intuitive knowing. In this time and place, we don't get that learning, right? We get other forms of learning. 
And then the third thing is really your very close system, like your family system. Let's say that you were born in this time and place, but in your family, you had an auntie who was a tarot card reader and received all kinds of intuitive messages. If you were exposed to her in a positive way, you might develop more of your own intuitive ways of sensing. If she was the family pariah and everybody's going, oh, there's Aunt Thelma again, oh my gosh, you'd be like, no way, I'm gonna be intuitive because I'm gonna get ostracized for that, right? So the answer is, Yes, there are people who are more intuitive than others. Some of it might be nature. Some of it is nurture. Nature can often be changed, yet nurture can. We can always develop this. So talking about development, as you know, an area that I'm really interested in is how do we create um, different leaders for a new world? And what I mean by that is we know that there is, we're living in a really complicated time. We know the world is facing a lot of challenges and we all know some of our systems need to shift. So I have a belief that we need a different type of leader into the future, which probably needs different skills than we've had. It doesn't mean that we've had bad leaders per se. It's just that we might need different capabilities to be able yeah. to solve the big world challenges that we're facing and to create new types of industry and new ways of working. But on that, what I'm really curious about is what role could intuition play for leaders? First of all, I think we live in a time where a lot of our information sources are becoming either things we don't trust in like we once did or sometimes like So we can get bombarded as leaders with all kinds of different information. You know, we can pick up this report and read this, that, and the other thing and go, wow, really interesting. And we can pick up that report and read this, that, and the other thing and go, oh my gosh, we could really be making a mistake if we did what that report said. You know, how do you decide? Well, I think one of the best leadership skills that any of us can develop is, this, is, is really the skill and the practice. It's not, a, it's not something we're born with, it's something we cultivate and develop yeah. of presence. And I consider presence to be yeah. when we are paying more attention to the information that is within us than we are to the information that is outside of us. So in a moment of presence, Sam, if you and I were sitting in the same room facing each other and we both dropped in, we'd be receiving a lot of information from the ambient energies around us. And everything is, you know, energy is a real thing. We all know that, you know, but the energies around us might be giving us more information. So I might feel like Sam and I are talking about different things. and We both want different things from this outcome. Yet I'm feeling a real alignment with her in terms of maybe the values that are motivating us to, to, to make these decisions. So it appears that we had a little glitch in the matrix and um, yay, technology, technology works. <laughs> so you know, it, and now we're also a little bit tentative because we could get another glitch again. But here's what I want to say. Nothing matters more than cultivating a presence practice. Bitter. And I think we captured some of that when we were recording. But to continue on that thought, you know, I like to feel that when I'm thinking, I'm in time. And in time, I'm on a linear path from the past to the present into the future. When I am truly in presence, I feel like I have access to space. There is much, yeah. and that might sound a little bit, a word that I actually love, who is awesome, what's well, another conversation. Maybe that's, and by the way, we tend to pathologize intuition by calling it woo sometimes, you know that? Yeah. But what I'm going to say, it's actually learned, quantum I've... mechanics. It's actually, it's actually physics. It's actually something that I think is almost sort of particle and wavy, wavy and particle-y. So in time, we have access to certain types of information and outcomes we can draw in the past. In space, I think there is a much more full spectrum of sensing awareness that is available to us in our bodies, in our central nervous system through the spinal cord, medulla oblongata, up right into the brain, and then throughout all of the cognitive functions. And presence is a practice that anyone can cultivate and develop. You never, <laughs> it's a cute thing, you never really learn to be present. You're always practicing being more present. And the more we do it, the easier it becomes. The more we do it, the more easily we drop into it. And again, a big entry point for it is simply one breath. So I'm curious on that. Um, I know a practice that I have is something called a three by three, where three times a day, I literally take out time to be able to tap into how I'm feeling through my senses. 
Woo-woo. And I ask myself the questions around um, what am I smelling? What am I tasting? Woo-woo. My feeling? What am I seeing? And um, then I also just tap into like, how am I feeling right now? Like what's going on? So I do a quick body scan in some ways, but to bring me present in that moment. And I'm curious if you have anything that there is that you might do. Well, I don't even know if I could name what I do. I think it's It's so habituated over time. Yet, Sam, that's a fantastic practice. And you even use the words body scan. I think at any of us, any time, you know, we all know that feeling where we get a feeling in our body like, We just got something, and then the brain is highly conditioned to override that feeling. The more we can tap in and learn to do that body scan, you know, the more, what am I feeling right now? I think the more information we have access to and can make useful, you know, to go through our lives. So I'm all about it. I remember two instances that are really, really uh, clear examples. One time I was parked in my front yard. I opened the door to my car, and as soon as I opened the door, I just got this big wave of like anxiety just washing over me. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what do I, what's going on? Like, I just had this feeling. And um, I paid attention to it. I took a deep breath so it didn't sort of amplify more. But it turned out it's just sort of a funny thing. Like there was something actually wrong with my car that needed to be addressed. Another time, so that's a time where it, it just like, you learn to listen to the information your body is giving you we don't know why we're getting this or how we're getting this, but it's right there. And then there was another time, and this one's a little bit of an intense example, but I was one time in a parking lot in San Francisco when I was living there, and it was a dark parking lot. And it was, you know, probably 6.30 at night was already evening. And I had parked next to a big wall, and I opened the door. And I was walking up to my car. I pressed the button to unlock the door. And as I rounded the bend, there was a... San Francisco can be a little rough sometimes. But a very large man kind of came around the corner, walking right into me. But my intu- normally my intuition would be like, oh, I'd be scared or something. Maybe that would have been the feeling. For some reason at that moment, I felt like everything was okay. Like I really felt in my body that there was nothing to yeah. worry about. And so the man was as surprised as I did was because I walked around the corner, he walked around the corner. He was a much larger person than I was. And I said to him, and I don't know why I said it or where it came from, I go, I hope I didn't startle you. And he started cracking up. Like, he just started laughing. He goes, I think I'm supposed to say that to you. (laughs) (laughs) It was really adorable, actually. But those were two moments in my life where my body instantly gave me, like, well, the first time was like a lightning bolt feeling. And then the second time, it was just more like a different type of feeling. In the moment after I felt that more like, it's all going to be fine, of course my mind went and said, but wait, this is a guy in a dark parking lot. But I decided to sort of stay with what my body was telling me. I'm not sure I'll ever do that again or, you know, thank goodness it wasn't the wrong thing to do. I mean, I don't know what the future holds, but it was a time when my intuition guided me with a more complete set of information than my brain alone could have come up with. Beautiful. Well, I think we're probably at about time. I'm curious if you have any last tips on what people can do to either develop their own intuition or what you'd like to encourage people to do with their intuition. Yeah, strange. So first of all, I think one thing would be remember eight-year-old Sam doing what she loved because it felt great teaching in the front yard, right? We can all look at our eight-year-old selves and remember who we were at that time and maybe got get a little sense of what our intuition knew that we don't call upon as much now that we're in our adult years. That's one. And then the other one is watch kids. It is absolutely amazing. If you watch the way children play together, you can even see them like sometimes take a little momentary pause to like let information register in their total intelligence rather than just acting purely on what their brain is telling them. And I would just like to add to that, and for those of us that do have kids, I don't myself, um, but is to encourage them to continue to allow to have that intuition. And I just think back to what we started off with earlier in the conversation around, you should do this or you shouldn't do that, or how do we, that's, you know what, you're being too creative or you're being too this way. 
and even to ourselves now as adults when we catch ourselves doing that how do we allow ourselves more to be like hey actually you know what i am going to be more creative and lean into that and kind of tap into that child that we used to have i love that you called that out and so you know another thing we can do is when we come to a decision point if we have that moment to think about it we can ask ourselves you know what does my brain tell me i should do but if i listen more deeply into that fuller intelligence what does it tell me i should do we can look at the different sorts of information that come up and actually use them in helpful ways rather than just push one or the other side. And I think that might be our next one, our next conversation that we have around what are those other parts of our body telling us? But cool. thank you, Ellen, for your time. It's been amazing thank as you. always to get time A with pleasure. you. A pleasure. So nice to see you, Sam. Thank, thank you. you. So good to see you too. Okay. Bye-bye.